This is Ruth L. Snyder from Choices from Struggle to Strength. And today I'm very happy to have Rachel Thompson with me. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you for having me, Ruth. You're very welcome. So tell us a little bit about your story, what you are passionate about and why. Sure. I'm not going to go into explicit detail, but when I was 11 years old, uh, my family moved from Southern California to Northern California, and we moved into a neighborhood that was just developing. So there weren't many kids there. And so um, a neighbor moved in next door and they had like three or four girls and a son and a pool. And so everybody in the neighborhood was like, wow, let's go hang out over there at their house. And they were very welcoming in the whole thing. Well, it ends up that the father started abusing not only me, but also um, two younger girls. I was 11 and the girls were like four and six. And so one of the mom this went on for about a year and he was in the military carried a gun very tall big man so obviously intimidating mm -hmm. and he would threaten us that he would you know hurt us or hurt, hurt our families if we said anything and of course we believe that because we're right. young mm -hmm. and you believe what adults tell you and so I was terrified like he told me if I said anything like I would go to jail so I was too young to not know this wasn't true. And so I didn't say anything. And then eventually it came out through one of the other younger girls and there was an investigation. There was a, a civil trial. Unfortunately for a criminal trial, they didn't feel like they could put the whole case on one person, which was me because the other girls were just too young to, right. to really talk about it. And, um, and then there was a military trial so he was court-martialed he and released um and that was the end of that for him and then he got i think 18 months at a local jail like it was not that big of a wow. deal and then he was out now this was the 70s so things you know I, I was born in 64 so things are handled a little bit differently now but i did have to go and testify in both the military trial and the civil trial mm. And it was hard. It was it, terrifying that I had to face him in court and say the things that he had done, but I did it. And then, um, you know, he went to jail and my parents didn't move. And so I ended up going to school with his kids and having them bully me because they thought it was my fault that their dad went to jail and the whole thing. And so I started developing some mental health issues without really even understanding what was going on. So I started having panic attacks. Um, I couldn't get out of bed. Hypervigilance was a big one and still is because I was so concerned that he was going to climb in my little sister's window. She was a year old and, you know, harm her. And so um, to this day, I still have a lot of hypervigilance where if somebody makes a noise, you know, I jump and I cry and, and there's really like, it's like out of my control. So there's some things that I developed not understanding these were normal coping skills to in a completely abnormal situation. It was, right. you know, my reaction to crime basically and gun violence as well. It took me a long time to really understand that I was a victim of gun violence too, because I wasn't shot or anything like that, but I was threatened. Mm -hmm. Um, so then, you know, I moved away, got married, got worked for pharma, did that for 17 years, have two children. And then it's all sort of hit me when I had my daughter, I was 35 years old. So she's 23 now. And I went into just a complete meltdown. How am I going to keep this little baby safe? She's so perfect and beautiful. And I was a mess. Um, so my doctor got me into um, a shrink. And so what he basically said was that I was having this anxiety over keeping her safe because of what happened to me. And that's why I just literally, I couldn't, I couldn't leave her with anybody. I just freaked out. So we worked through a lot of that. And then I ended up getting divorced um, after 22 years. Mm. And the kids are with me full time and he, he left town. And I didn't understand a lot of what was going on in the marriage either. He was never physically abusive or anything like that, but he wouldn't support me as a survivor. He didn't want me to say anything to anybody. It embarrassed him. 
Um, and he definitely didn't want me to ever tell our children because he thought that it would instill this sense of fear in them. And I said, well, that's not a bad thing, <laughs> right? Because we're right. also worried about stranger danger, but mm -hmm. let's, let's worry about the people that are around our children, coaches, neighbor parents, right? We send our kids off to, to you know, go and have a sleepover at someone's house. We don't know the parents. So I'm that parent, not anymore because my, my kids are older, but I'm that parent who would call them and say, can I bring him by? Let's take a look around. You have guns in the home. Are they locked up? Like I'm that annoying parent, right? But I never felt apologetic for that because I feel like as a parent, you prevent what you can prevent, right? Some of it's out of our hands. Right. So once I finally um, quit pharma and started writing is when I um, have now released three books about it. And I do a weekly sex abuse chat on Twitter spaces. I've done the chat. If, you, if you're familiar with Twitter, um, spaces is fairly new, which is social audio, right? So before, if you wanted to have a chat, you had a hashtag and everyone had to type the chat, the hashtag in. And it's a lot of work to do that. So I'm really enjoying the fact that we can now hear each other's voices and talk about these difficult, you know, topics that are important and that matter. Mm. Wow. Thanks for sharing. Um, you know, it's, I knew that you had your space and you, and that was the topic of your space, but I didn't know the full extent of your story. Yeah. And those things that happen to us, our body remembers them. The trauma is there. Yes. Yeah. And, yes. Deal with it, and right? that's really, that's why I started the sex abuse chat, because we talk about things that, that survivors deal with every day, all the time, including people like saying, why can't you just get over it or mm -hmm. something like that? And I always say, well, you know, I would love to, but you need to talk to my brain and my cells because <laughs> everything is changed physiologically when you are abused in some manner or, or go through some sort of trauma. It doesn't have to be abuse, but yes. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I want to talk with people about the difficult stuff like hypervigilance. You know, most people either don't identify that in themselves and don't know what it is like I didn't mm -hmm. or they want to share that things like this are happening and they don't know what to do right and so those are the types of things that we cover mm -hmm. and sometimes we normalize it if we're living with it long <laughs> enough and so to have somebody say no that's not normal we need to have those conversations as well right yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when I, when people say something to me, like, why do you keep talking about it? You're never going to heal or something like that. And I say, well, talking about it is a form of healing. And so I'm never going to feel shame or bad or sad because I'm talking about difficult, uncomfortable topics. I always say that I'm writing books that matter. And that's the main point of what I'm trying to do is to get people to understand that our, our whole body, our brains, everything, our, our nervous system is affected by trauma. You can heal. It's not like it's impossible, but it does take work and support and love. And time usually. <laughs> and time. Absolutely. You know, the average age for somebody who's been abused as a child to disclose that abuse is 51. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's not uncommon. That's from Child USA. I follow them and support them. Hmm. So it's important to know and understand. Yeah. So was there a particular time during your struggle when you knew that you had to make a choice to change what was happening in your life? I, I wouldn't say at the age of 11 because I, I felt stuck, right? I had no idea what was happening and um, I was terrified to come forward. But I think once I had my daughter, that really pushed me into getting the psychological help that I needed and understanding that I had, um, you know, generalized anxiety, I obviously had postpartum depression, but they, once we talked about it, I probably had been depressed for years, but didn't know or understand. And I'm not a stupid woman. I'm very well read. But if you think about it, when you're in it, it's hard to be objective about what's happening. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I would say starting therapy was huge for me. And then yes. about 10 years, 10 or 15 years after that, I started specifically trauma recovery. And I kind of rejected that at first because I thought, well, 
what am I recovering from? I, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I'm very boring. You know, <laughs> uh, maybe buying too many books is my addiction, right? You know, like, how bad is that? <laughs> But then I started to understand the, the, the very different ways that things were affecting me and also that I was in a relationship where he did not support my recovery. So that ended, I ended that. I don't feel bad about it. Probably one of the best things I could have done. How has this struggle made you a stronger person? I mean, you've talked about how you're helping other people and that you went through therapy, but how has it made you stronger? I think getting comfortable with talking about uncomfortable topics is probably one of my better skills that I'm always working on, of course. Um, but a lot of people will come have come in. I mean, I've probably interacted with thousands of survivors over the years. And I think for a lot of people, they just want to be heard they want to be validated mm -hmm. because we get a lot of this, you know, social media court and jury where nothing's been proven or disproven. And yet people are saying, well, what's the proof? And that's the trick with um, sexual crimes, right? Unless there is physical evidence, which may or may not happen. Mm -hmm. How are you going to say that this is the person that this did this to me and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So I think being able to address a lot of these very difficult topics, I've done a ton of research and I'm actually in, in August going to be going through trauma recovery coaching. Mm. So I'm very excited about that. Because a lot of therapists are not trauma trained. So right. coaching, as I'm sure you know, has become a big, big thing, right? In yes. life, everybody needs to coach. But do you need a coach to help you deal with sexual trauma? Absolutely. So I'm looking forward to that. Even if I never end up coaching people, I feel like it's going to help me research and understand even more. And I think that makes me very strong because I'm able to look at it and say, okay, this is helpful. This may not be so helpful. Let's create safe spaces for people. And that's really what I do. So tell us a little bit more about what's the difference between like a life coach and a trauma informed coach? Well, um, I'm not a life coach, so I don't have that training, but my understanding is that you it's a six month program. It's like going back to school and getting a, an advanced degree, but in a shorter amount of time. And you have to, you know, be taped. You have to go through all of this practicum hours where you are treating um, other coaches that are going through this. And then you get real time coaching as well. And so the fact that it's called the International Trauma Recovery coaching center. I think I have it right. I'm not sure. Um, I can share that with you in a link later if anyone is interested. Um, they only allow 12 people per session because they want to make sure that it's very focused. So wow. I'm really excited about that. But I think, you know, going, I always tell people therapy is very important and don't rule it out. Mm -hmm. But if for some reason you feel like you're not getting that trauma their trauma trained therapist, then maybe it's time to look for someone like a coach who does nothing but that. Right. Or maybe it's time for you to get your own training, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. We learned so much, you know, I've learned so much. I mean, it really took me until probably when I wrote my first broken book to for someone to diagnose me as having PTSD and I have a chronic migraines, not one doctor. And I worked in pharma for 17 years. Not one doctor said, Hey, is there anything in your past? Might you have had trauma in your wow. past? Not one. Crazy. And that's, that's what's missing. I think from the medical industry is, you know, if you are a neurologist, then you focus on the brain and that's it. Mm -hmm. And if you're a family practitioner, you look at the whole body, but you may not pick up the psychological symptoms. So yeah, I think there's a lot of training that needs to be done that isn't being done, at least in the US. Mm -hmm. And connections that need to be made, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you've talked a little bit about some opportunities that you have now because of what you've experienced. What other doors have opened because of your experiences and training? Well, a couple of things. I mean, writing about them, of course, has been huge. And I don't write my books so that I can just, I, I don't look at them as catharsis. I even write about catharsis in my latest release, Broken People. 
And I say, you know, hey, Mildred, clean up an aisle three. We got them some catharsis on the floor, you know, like it just doesn't happen like that. You don't write the book and then boom, you're all better, right? So for me, right. I, I think it's been a part of, of healing, which has been really helpful. But um, I also feel like there's other ways to connect with people. So one of the wonderful things that's come out of all this is I was contacted by a large international pharmaceutical company to uh, be on their shareholder panel. So we talk about PTSD, we talk about therapy after trauma, they're trying to get conversations started, it has nothing to do with whatever meds they have, we don't even talk about that. And so it's really nice. I've done two of these panels so far. It's great to see the very different aspects of what people are studying teaching, learning, and that kind of information is now being disseminated. So I think it's really interesting to see there's, there's this whole sort of understanding now that trauma can be passed down to future generations called epigenetics. And so these are the types of things that people are studying. And I think maybe that'll change eventually the, the public's way of dealing with it, which is sweep it under the rug dismiss right. it, minimize it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, well, at least you're still alive. Well, at least, you know, you held right. the gun, but he didn't shoot you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> a little but toxic it did positive. Change me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm lucky. Like, wait a minute. So I think we need to change that conversation for sure. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yes, a lot of times it could be worse, but we do need to acknowledge that it wasn't good and there is healing that needs to take place. Yeah, and it's okay to talk about it if we want to. Right. Yeah. Yes, and unfortunately, a lot of times people are not given permission to talk about it. Yeah, there's a lot of things that can go into play. What I still tell people, I have a couple of gals I'm working with now who um, privately who are in situations that aren't very healthy. And so we're trying to create some kind of, you know, escape plan or something like that. So I think just connecting with people on that deeper level, instead of the, hey, how you doing? Then we're able to talk about these things and hopefully make a difference in people's lives. Mm-hmm. And I've found that in my own life too, when I share a bit of my story, then people feel like they can share what they're going through and they know that we can understand what they're going through, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what advice do you have for people who may be going through trauma or abusive situations? Document as much as you possibly can. So I know that can be hard if you're in a dangerous situation. There are computer programs, there are um, audio apps. In some way, it's a good idea to document what's happening, even if there's nothing that you could quote unquote, show somebody, because a lot of abusers can be very surreptitious. So they won't give you, you know, issues on your face or where anybody can see. Um, if it's sexual trauma, I, I say the same thing um, because people are going to ask you questions later on that you won't be able to answer or because of our fight or flight or fawn or freeze, whatever those um, reactions are, that can have an issue on memory retrieval as well. So I just tell people document everything, you know, put some kind of security on it, whether it's your password protection or fingerprint or whatever. And then the other thing is I tell people that that action of writing things down, whether it's in a, it's, it, it can be any way somebody wants it to be. It can be very artistic with drawings and all that, or it could just be, you know, this happened, then that happened, then this happened, then that happened. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Documenting is probably the most important thing. And then, you know, seeking help. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know, for example, I didn't know until I moved up here and I, there was some financial abuse that happened with my ex and I didn't have money to get us all into therapy. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, every county has free mental health uh, mm -hmm. care clinics usually. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I started with, with all three of us, my daughter, my son, and myself. And again, this was probably eight or nine years ago. Um, and they were very helpful. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, these are people getting their hours, you know, they don't have the degree yet. And I'm like, it doesn't really matter. I think a lot of people who go into this really want to help people. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to be there for you in the ways that they can. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really helpful too. So to, you know, even if it's just online, if you come to my sex abuse chat and then mm -hmm. you DM me and say, Hey, I'm kind of stuck. I don't know what to do. 
I'm not going to counsel you, but I will give you resources that can help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've mentioned a little bit about reaching out. Community, I think, is really important when we're going through anything, trying. Yes. But how do people find that supportive community when they're going through something so personal? Yeah, it can be hard. I think now that we're online so much and we live our lives so much from you know, the comfort of our office or home, um, we can have that sort of privacy that may, we may not have if we're trying to talk to a friend, you know, over coffee. So there's a lot of, um, I have a sex abuse chat community. I vet everybody who asks to enter and we talk about the same topics we talk about in sex abuse chat, but you know, whenever we feel like it. Um, I think creating safe spaces for other people mm -hmm. and for yourself mm -hmm. is in just so incredibly important and understanding that we matter, that even if somebody outside of us doesn't validate what happened, we know we were there. We can trust the feelings that we have are valid. Right. And so I think reaching out to other people joining groups, coming into spaces, mm -hmm. talking um, on these panels, like all this stuff helps get more information out there for somebody who, who may feel completely stuck. I think for a lot of us, just acknowledging to ourselves that what we're living with is not healthy mm -hmm. is the first step. Yes, absolutely. If you're in a, an abusive marriage and you realize that you need help and you need to get out, and you're terrified because you don't know who you can trust, that's a very isolating, lonely feeling. So if you can reach out, you know, RAIN, R-A-I-N-N, RAIN.org uh, is available 24-7, 365 days out of the year in the United States. I'm not sure about, I know in, in the UK, they have Samaritans. I'm not sure about in Canada. Um, don't you have Bell something? Yes, we have Bell. That's one of the internet providers. Oh, okay. They have something, but most places also have like women's shelters or yes. places like that, that will yes. provide information. You know, you can call them, even if you don't go to the shelter, they will give you resources and information. Yeah. I found most people in this whole entire area of support. I mean, I say sadly, because it's sad that we even have to have this. But the fact that it is available to people, it takes a little elbow grease, I think, to find something that's a perfect fit for you. Right. But there are a lot of people out there who you could say, hey, where do I go? What do I do? Mm -hmm. That kind of information, very helpful. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share? Um, well, I, I did write three books about it. The, it's called The Broken Series. So I've written Broken Pieces. I probably released in 2014 the first time. I ended up being published. I self-published, then I hybrid published, and then I was with a traditional publisher with an agent. And I am now back to self-publishing. So I'm just uploading. I just uploaded the update to my 30 day book marketing challenge. I, as my business, I help writers learn how to create their author platform, connect them with people like editors and coaches and people that they need, you know, might need help with. And then I also manage their social media. So I have, you know, I, I, I fully understand the being a writer and just wanting to write. And then also putting on my marketing hat and understanding marketing and advertising and promotion and all that social media, all that stuff and putting it all together. For me, it's a great puzzle and I enjoy that. So I do write books about uh, creating your platform, understanding SEO. I have a new one coming out on branding. Mm. So I actually have eight books out. That's interesting. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I think just for, for anyone who, you know, wants to learn more or whatever, they can um, find me on Twitter at Rachel in the OC, pretty much across the board, whether you're on Facebook or Instagram, my website, it's all Rachel in the OC. And people say, what's the OC? If you're from California, you know, it's Orange County. There used to be a show ah. called the OC, right? <laughs> And then I lived there for 17 years and that's when I opened my Twitter account and it just sort of spiraled from there. So that's why I'm called Rachel in the OC because there are so many Rachel Thompsons 
there were already when I opened my account in 2009. And now there's so many more and people get us confused all the time because there's like three of us that are redheads, we're writers, <laughs> and our name is Rachel Thompson. <laughs> so Rachel and the OC helps me stand out a little bit. <laughs> little tip on branding and marketing there. Right? Yes, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when I was deciding what to use, I Googled Ruth Snyder and I discovered that Ruth Snyder is a woman in the early 1900s who murdered her husband with an ax. <laughs> ooh, ooh, like Lizzie Borden or something, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's why I use my middle initial in my... <laughs> Very smart. <laughs> <laughs> I want to establish my own identity. I don't want to be tied to her all the time. <laughs> no, no. I'm good, thanks. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for sharing with us today and for having me. look forward to having you share more in our Twitter space at the end of July. So if you are listening to this and you haven't listened to the Twitter space discussion, please do that. And remember to like and share. And yeah, I look forward to con continuing to get to know you, Rachel. I've appreciated our interactions and I appreciate that you are providing a safe space for many people who need it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thanks for the work you do as well, Ruth. You're very welcome.